Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Morrison Planetarium and to this, our final show of the day, which is a little bit different from the other presentations we've had earlier in the day. How many of you had uh, came earlier to see uh, Living Worlds, our other show? Nobody. Okay, so this is a brand new show for you. This is a little bit different from the other shows that we have here. Those shows, uh, Living Worlds in particular, is um, a, a playback show. Uh, this one is live, so that means I'm going to be piloting us through a 3D model of the universe um, using some software that is supported by NASA. And um, actually, it's available as a free download. So if you like what you see here, uh, you can come and see me after the show, and I can tell you how you can get your hands on the software. You can put it on your computer at home and fly around the universe. Um, because this is a live uh, presentation, um, uh, I'm going to try not to fly us into any black holes or crash into planets. However, because we're projecting everything onto the dome overhead, the immersiveness of that experience with the images going out to your peripheral vision uh, can sometimes create a very convincing illusion of movement. So um, during the show, you're not really going anywhere. The seats aren't, aren't moving. Um, and if you should start to feel a little um, un uncomfortable because of that illusion of movement, just close your eyes for a minute or so, and that sensation should go away. Now, as we get ready to do the show, I'll start things for you up on the control booth in the back. Uh, we would like to remind you one more time that during the show, we'd uh, appreciate it very much if you could please refrain from eating, drinking, snacking, any kind of photography or recording. This is also a great time to silence your personal electronics and thank you very much for keeping your masks on during the show at all times. Uh, at the end, everyone please use the doors at the top of the stairway and it will be closing time for the museum. So uh, we do want to uh, make sure we adhere to the museum rules as you exit the planetarium, just head toward the main exit um, at five o'clock or so. And with that, let's have a look at what we can see of our universe um, traveling into outer space. And actually, one number of years ago, one famous astronomer said, outer space is not that far away. In fact, it's only an hour's drive if cars could go straight up. So, and which is true because the, um, the uh, officially recognized boundary of outer space is said to be about 100 kilometers above the ground. And that is about 62 miles or so. So we're up in space right now, and we can see something up there, which is the usual place that many crews of astronauts and cosmonauts go to right now. That is the International Space Station, or ISS, as it's also called. This is the biggest thing ever put into space was built over a period of a number of years, beginning in uh, 1998, and it has been permanently occupied since about the year 2000 by crews of astronauts from the member countries that helped build the International Space Station. So you can see it's made of a number of different modules, and the footprint of the, the space station is about the size of the Academy, so roughly the size of an American football field, and that is as far as humans uh, travel from space nowadays, although we did at one time go even farther away, and there are some plans to go back uh, to a, a much more distant location, which is our own satellite, the moon. So as we pull away from the International Space Station, it is not falling down toward the Earth. It's just so small in comparison to the Earth, it'll take a while before we see the Earth itself recede in the distance. And there's our planet, and what we're going to do is change our point of view so that we're going to look for our nearest satellite, and that would be the moon. So let's look for the moon, which circles around our planet, and we're turning toward it right now. There it is in the distance, 240,000 miles away, a quarter of a million miles. And this is where a number of astronauts went between 19, um, oh, 1969 and 1972. That was during the Apollo program. And they went to several places on the surface of the moon, walked around, collected uh, rocks, and, and uh, did some scientific experiments there. And this is our nearest neighbor in outer space. Now you can see the moon is a very dry, rocky body. It doesn't have any atmosphere, no bodies of water. 
even though those dark patches are uh, sometimes called seas and oceans, they're actually flat plains of dried lava. They're known as the Maria. And you can see a lot of craters on the surface of the moon, especially in the lighter colored areas. Those craters were blasted out by the impact of asteroids and comets on the surface of the moon billions of years ago in many cases. Now, NASA does have plans to return to the surface of the moon uh, in, in a program called Artemis, which is a follow-up to the Apollo program. And uh, there are plans to do that before the end of the decade. So we'll see if they can do that. Now, I said that the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away from Earth, or uh, uh, about 240,000 miles. Um, it took the Apollo astronauts three days to get there. Um, but when looking at things in outer space, astronomers like to uh, measure things in terms of something faster than how fast a rocket goes, and that is the speed of light. Now, light is the fastest thing in the universe. It travels 186,000 miles per second. And that means if you could travel as fast as light, you could fly around the world seven times in one second. You could travel from the Earth to the moon in one and a half seconds. And as you fly out into space, you could get to more distant places pretty quickly. As we move farther and farther out, uh, let's add the orbits of uh, our solar system here, all the planets, and have a look at the bodies in our solar system. So we pulled back far enough away to see the sun there at the very center and also the orbits of the inner planets. We've got Mercury, the closest one to the sun, then Venus, then Earth, this is us, the third planet from the sun, and then the other planets are Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. To get from Earth to the sun at the speed of light would take about eight and a half minutes. To get to uh, some of the other more distant planets in our solar system, Mars would be about 20 minutes away. To get to Jupiter would take about 45 minutes. So you're, we can get uh, to places pretty quickly at the speed of light. We would, it would take a while to get to the outermost planets of our solar system. Uh, those outermost planets, of course, uh, Uranus and Neptune. And a lot of people often ask, well, what about Pluto? Isn't Pluto a planet? Well, officially not anymore, but um, a lot of people still like to include Pluto in the club. And let me uh, add Pluto's orbit to our solar system diagram. It's the outermost one here that crosses the orbit of Neptune. You can see that. So there's uh, that's our solar system, which um, is about, um, well, it's several hours uh, at the speed of light in diameter. But here you can see the orbit of Pluto as I'm rotating our solar system. You can see that it's, it's flat. All the, almost all the planets are on the same plane, except for Pluto, which is up at a, at a tilted at a very high angle. And that's one of the reasons why some astronomers thought that maybe Pluto should be called a different kind of object. So um, officially, it's called a dwarf planet. And there are a number of other dwarf planets in our solar system as well. And there will probably be a few others named that uh, uh, also. But let's continue traveling farther out because we do want to uh, travel as far out as we can in space. We're leaving our solar system far behind. And you know, as we do, we'll pass some of the spacecraft that have uh, left our solar system. And those are spacecraft like uh, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, and Pioneer 11. And you can see their paths here. Uh, Pioneer 10, which left uh, in the early 1970s, is the one going off all by itself. And Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and New Horizons are the ones all going off in the other direction. And those objects, those spacecraft, are pretty far out, several billion miles away, but not one of them has gone so far that it has gone as far as light can travel in one day. The most distant of these, Voyager 2, is maybe about 16 light hours away as far as light can travel in 16 hours, but not yet as far as light can travel in one day. So that's how big our solar system is. It is really huge. And as we travel even farther out, we'll encounter distances that take not just hours to cross, but 
years in some cases. As we leave our solar system behind, we'll enter, enter interstellar space. And this is where it takes years for light to travel. The nearest star to the sun is four and a half, uh, about four and a third light years away. And other stars are much farther away than that. And before we get too far away, let's also have a look at the most distant evidence of humanity in the universe, the farthest that any uh, anything that we have created has traveled, and that is our radio signals. Uh, for about 100 years, we've been sending radio signals out into space, and those have been radiating away from Earth at the speed of light, forming this giant bubble. This is our radio footprint in the universe, roughly 100 light years in radius or about 200 light years across. So this is as far as our radio signals have traveled, the most distant artifact of humanity. And beyond that is the rest of the universe. So let's travel even farther out and see how big the universe really is. As we do, we will see stars and our radio sphere recede in the distance. And as we do, we'll see where we are in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, about 100 years ago, astronomers thought the Milky Way was the only galaxy in the entire universe. But then an astronomer named Edwin Hubble, for whom the, the Hubble Space Telescope is named, uh, he discovered that there are other galaxies. Not only is the Milky Way uh, not the only galaxy in the universe, there are, are lots of others. And the galaxies are all moving apart from each other. They're moving away from one another, spreading farther and farther apart. And so Edwin Hubble dis, uh, established that the universe is much bigger than anyone had thought. And it's getting even bigger still because the universe is expanding. Now, the universe uh, is, uh, the, the Milky Way rather, is just one member of a cluster of galaxies called the Local Group. And now that we've left the Milky Way galaxy, we're seeing uh, those spots of light there that are not individual stars, but now are galaxies. Each spot of light you see there is a galaxy like our own. Now, uh, we see a couple of uh, other galaxies that accompany uh, the Milky Way through space. Uh, one is called the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy sort of like our own Milky Way, a flat disk of hundreds of billions of stars that is about two and a half million light years away. Our galaxy itself is about 100,000 light years across, but the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away. So it's light. It takes two and a half million years to reach us. We don't know what the Andromeda galaxy looks like right now because the light that we see when we go outside and look up into the sky, the light we see when we look at the Andromeda galaxy left it two and a half million years ago. So we can only see what it looked like two and a half million years ago. If you want to know what the Andromeda galaxy looks like right now in 2022, you have to be patient. And you've got to wait another two and a half million years for the light leaving it right now to reach us here on Earth. So mark your calendars. But let's continue traveling farther out. And you can see that our Milky Way is a member of a, a small cluster of, of galaxies called the Local Group. Consists of about 30 or so galaxies. But in the background, look at all the other galaxies and galaxy clusters that surround us. The galaxies are grouped into huge co collections, some clusters and some super clusters, some of them containing thousands of galaxies. And as we travel even farther out, we can see the universe starts to have a texture. There are empty voids um, separating clusters of galaxies. There are chains of galaxies. And uh, the, the, the universe almost takes on a sort of a foamy texture or, or spongy. You might even describe it as that. And these are all, uh, these are all based on actual data real surveys of the universe showing us where galaxies are located in space. So this is all based on the real thing. Now, as you travel even farther out, we see other clusters of galaxies surrounding us, and the universe begins to take on a very unusual shape, or at least our model of the universe starts to look a little odd. Because as seen from a certain angle, 
look at this here. It starts to look sort of like a giant hourglass or a big butterfly. You see those two cones going off on either in either direction, or big fans, you might even describe them as that. Is that the real shape of the universe? A big butterfly? It'd be kind of cute, but no, it's not. The reason the, the universe, our model of the universe looks like this is because those empty spaces between the two big fans going off to the sides, that is not empty space. That is just uh, parts of the sky that we haven't mapped very well yet because there's something in our way blocking our view. Now, what do you think is blocking our view? Well, think back to when we looked at our own Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way is a flat disk. And when we look along the plane of that disk, there's a lot of dust and gas there that's blocking our view. And that's what's happening when we see those empty spaces between the two fans in our model of the universe. So eventually, our model will get better, we'll fill out more galaxies in that area, and we're beginning to, those pale lavender uh, uh, galaxies uh, forming sort of a disk here. Those are our more recent discoveries. Uh, but we will eventually fill out our, our map of the universe, and it'll look a lot more uniform. As we continue traveling farther out, one really interesting thing to, to keep in mind is that the farther out in space we, we look, the farther back in time we're looking. Remember how far away the Andromeda galaxy is? I said that's about two and a half million light years away. So it's when we look at it, we're looking two and a half million years into the past. And if we look far enough out, we see some of the most distant objects that we can see, and those are the quasars, those orange uh, dots that you see at the ends of the big fans. Those are about 10 billion light years away in general. So when we look at quasars, we're seeing things that are 10 billion years in the past. So one of the most mind-boggling things about the universe is that the farther out in space we look, the farther back in time we're looking. And the farthest out we have been able to detect anything is so far out that all we can see is a faint radiation that comes from every direction, something called the cosmic microwave background. And this is way almost 13 point, almost 13 and a half billion light years away. And this is radiation, light, that was emitted uh, throughout the universe only a few hundred thousand years after the galaxies began to separate from each other. So that's a time that astronomers call the Big Bang, and this cosmic microwave background is radiation that started to permeate the universe and started to travel from one place to another about three or 400,000 years after the Big Bang. This is the oldest light that we can see and evidence uh, of the beginning of the formation of galaxies. This is a, actually a temperature map that shows where some areas are hotter or cooler than others, and it shows the beginning of the differentiation of matter clumping together to form the first stars and galaxies. So that is as far as we have been able to see the beginning of the expansion of the universe, or a little bit after that. And that gives us only one direction to go, and that's back in toward the center. But is it really toward the center? Uh, our map really does make it look as if we're at the center of the universe because everything sprays out, fans out from us. Is that really the situation? Are we really the center of the universe? It might make us feel really proud of ourselves, but no, it's not. The, the shape of uh, the universe and the fact that it looks like we're at the center is just the, uh, a result of the fact that we're the ones who made the map. So it's just based on our point of view. If somebody else in some other distant corner of the universe made their own map of the universe, it would look like everything is surrounding them from their point of view. So they're, they're, we really don't know where the center of the universe is. And, and some scientists say there really isn't a center per se. But as you travel farther uh, and back in toward, uh, toward where we came from, we'll pass these clusters of galaxies and super clusters of galaxies. And uh, just keep in mind that, you know, our map of the universe only shows the stuff that we can see. There's a lot of other stuff that we can't see. And by looking at the motions of objects of the galaxies and 
clusters of galaxies, astronomers say that there's there should be a lot more stuff out there. There should be a lot more matter, a lot more mass, to make galaxies move the way they do. What we see account for only about 4% of the mass that is making the universe do what we see it doing. And so they say that 96% of the universe is stuff that we can't see. It doesn't interact with light or electromagnetic radiation. It does have gravity. It has mass. But we don't know what else it can do. So this stuff combined is called dark matter and dark energy. And it is another one of those mind-boggling mysteries of the universe, which I said is one mind-boggling thing after another. So let's travel back in toward our own Milky Way, which we can see appearing there. We're traveling back in toward the edge of one of those spiral arms that uh, winds out from the center, back in toward our radio sphere, our radio footprint, the evidence that humanity is here. It's a sign that says we were here. And if we travel in, let's consider one other thing. As big as the universe is, you kind of wonder whether there are other planets, other solar systems out there. Maybe there's a place where life can exist. Well, astronomers have been looking for extrasolar planets since about 1994. And in that time, they have found almost, now almost 5,000 other planets orbiting distant stars. Some of those exoplanets, as they're called, are inside our own radio sphere. Most of them are outside of it. So our radio signals haven't gotten there yet. But if there are civilizations somewhere close enough to pick up our radio signals, they might be listening. If they're a little bit farther out, just outside the radio sphere, they wouldn't know about us yet. So that's an interesting thought. But of all those extrasolar planets that we know about, are any of them places where life can actually survive? We don't know. We don't know enough about them. You need a number of, of, of certain conditions in order for life to, to exist on a planet. It's got to be on, a, 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 as far as we know, a planet that has a solid surface. It's got to orbit the right kind of star. It's got to uh, orbit at the right distance from its star, not too close, not too far away. So the temperature has to be just right in order for liquid water to exist on its surface. And liquid water is so important for life we think that if you want to find life, you need to find the water. So that's something that astronomers uh, are, are looking for, places where water can exist. And on top of that, there are lots of other conditions that have to be fulfilled. You've got to have the right kinds of, of minerals and elements and, and other components that will support life and, and provide the kinds of nutrients that life needs to survive. So far, we haven't found planets outside our solar system that fulfill all those conditions. And so as far as we know, there's only one place that does, and that's our own planet Earth. So as, as we see in our travels through the universe, there's no place like home. Our planet is a very special, very fragile place where life exists in a delicate balance with its environment. And that means we've got to do everything we can to take good care of this planet to make sure that it can continue to support and sustain the life upon its surface. And with that, I'd like to welcome you all home, back home, to the good planet Earth. And that concludes our tour of the universe, and we thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you all. Uh, as the, the lights come up, please take a moment to check around your seats and make sure you're not leaving any personal items behind. Cell phones, cameras, wallets, and remember the exits are at the top of either stairway. It is now closing time for the museum, so we do have to ask that you start heading toward the exits from the museum as well. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about the software that we used, you can come and see me at the control booth. And uh, we thank you all very much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we hope you uh, have a very good evening tonight.